Listeners, thanks for tuning in to another Discussions with Dow. This is the Low Dow, where I go one-to-one with a guest, and we cover life, motivation, success. This facet of life, a big part of a lot of people's lives, pets, and success in how to manage your relationship with them. Today, we have Lorena Patty with Waggers Dogworks. Lorena, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. It's, this is awesome. I'm very, very excited. One of the first things I should discuss is, Lorena, what would you call your title? What, when people ask you, what do you do? How do you explain it? I normally introduce myself as a canine behavior specialist. So it's a little bit more than being a trainer. Uh, I am a trainer, absolutely. Um, Training meaning that you're teaching a dog how to respond to certain cues. Um, And, you know, you normally think about the obedience aspect of things. But I also work a lot with dogs who have aggression issues and fear issues. 99% of aggression issues are going to be fear-based. So I do take it a step further, and that's why I do call myself a canine behavior specialist, although there's no real official title. To get to that point, what does the background look like? Did it start off as you went to veterinary school and then branched off with your own research and findings? Or I'll tell you something about uh, the training world. It's completely unregulated. There is nothing legally that needs to happen to allow someone to call themselves a trainer. Hmm. So pretty much anyone, anyone at all can hang up their shingle and say, all right, I'm a trainer, bring your dog over to me. Now, well, that's not too different from actually the fitness industry. Uh, there are certifications, there are schools, not every personal trainer is created equal, but the, the nitty gritty of it, to, to put, put up a sign and say that you're a personal trainer, it's exactly like you mentioned right there. You just <laughs> got to put up the sign. Yeah, yep. And it is a little scary, just like it is a little scary to go to someone who calls themselves a, a personal trainer and could have somebody do something that's going to wind up hurting them. And the same thing can most definitely happen in the dog training industry. So it is very much a buyer beware type of um, environment. And really what can really differentiate trainers from Joe Schmo on the street are things like education and certifications that they have obtained. And by certifications, mostly I'm talking about the type of certifications that are independently verified. So for example, um, what is called a uh, certified professional dog trainer knowledge assessed. And that is a test that I did take and it is independently verified. I do have to prove that I understand the basic knowledge of learning and the basics of canine uh, body language, uh, canine communication, um, different types of uh, training uh, techniques or different types of training um, methodologies. And uh, that kind of a certification is a really, really great starting point for anyone who's looking for someone who is a trainer. Within that, there's also two very, very different types of training that the regular person is going to be encountering. There's the more traditional training, and that's the kind that most people have heard of, which is you know being the leader of the pack, being the alpha, being the one who establishes the dominance part. That's one side of things. And then there's also the more recent one that's more scientifically backed, Uh, training that's based on positive reinforcement. I personally, along with many of my colleagues, do focus solely on the positive reinforcement. And the reason for that is because science, recent science, has determined that this is the most effective way of teaching. And it comes with pretty much a no risk factor in the sense that whatever you're doing to the animal as you're training it, you're not creating unexpected behavioral fallout, which is something that happens very much when people... What you're jumping into is something that was, I think, the original reason why my listeners want me to reach out to a pet behavioralist or a communications expert, because most people, so this is me saying it, so there, there's no liability issues towards mm-hmm. Lorena. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with pet communication because of Caesar Milan. 
yeah. and the dog whisperer. And through the show and the way they edited things, you saw results through that. Yeah. Um, but it's very much a, what you were talking about, being dominant, being the alpha, leading by the example. And throughout the years, you saw more articles talking about that's basically abuse. And when you talk about behavioral fallout, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, behavioral fallout really means unexpected behaviors that are going to crop up. And one of the most common results is increased aggression. And that's very, very common. And the reason for that is that it turns out that that whole dominance theory was uh, actually wrong. It's been disproven. Also, the fact that dogs know that we're not dogs. They know we're different. They understand that. So when we or anyone tries to establish dominance on a dog and just stare them down, do an alpha roll, you know, where you try to roll them on their back and put your face in front of them and growl at them. What that does is it increases the fear in the animal. Mm -hmm. And basically it scares them. It scares them. And any animal that feels scared enough is going to try to defend itself. And that's just normal, natural biology, whether you're a dog, a human, a worm, whatever. You know, a lot of people look at their pets as family. Mm -hmm. uh, I, part of this podcast and part of this episode, which I'm really interested to look into, is how much crossover there is with pet rearing and child raising. Because I look at, let's say you have a very strict parental household. Mm -hmm. And... Sure, they, they set the rules, there's a code, you follow it, and you can have whatever form of success, but there's a lot of fallout from that. Uh, the lack of love or the sense of love, resentment, just unhappiness that builds up throughout. So to me, hearing all this, it, it makes complete sense. Yep, and you touched, you hit the nail on the head, in all honesty. Um, a lot of the basic communication type things um, that have been applied to dog training a lot and, and animal training is in the field of applied behavior analysis. And that's a field that is professional and it's a field that started with humans and understanding how humans uh, process information. Those applications have to do with humans who are nonverbal, like very young children, for example. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge, huge parallel. And I say this from personal experience. Uh, I have a son myself and he's six now. You know, believe it or not, being a dog trainer has made me a better mom. And it's really applying those, those principles of praise, of catching them in the act of being good rather than catching them in the act of being bad really, really does have a huge, huge effect. Now, does it mean that I just let them get away with anything? No, absolutely not. Being positive does not mean being permissive. There's a huge difference between the two. There is guidance, you know, there is guidance. And there is, there is discipline. And, ke and keep in mind that when I say discipline, I mean teaching. That's what discipline truly means. It's not punishment. That's not what, what discipline is. It's guidance. And that's really how I've seen my role, both as a mom and as a dog owner, is to be a guide for them. My job is to guide them in this crazy world of humans. And really focusing, being able to focus on the positive when they're being good and redirecting them and showing them what to do when they're not being good quote unquote it's not so much that they're not that they're being bad it's just that they're doing something we'd rather they wouldn't do that's really what it boils down to and uh being able to redirect them and show them what to do instead is really powerful because it empowers them and it gives them it shows them that when they make certain choices great things happen and that they can actually control their environment by making the appropriate choices without right. fear of being punished, without fear of being bullied or intimidated or hurt. And that is extremely important for overall behavioral wellness, not just with kids, but also with your pets at home, be they a dog, a cat, hamster, ferret, whatever. Control of their environment is a huge, huge element in making any animal feel safe. 
And when they feel safe, you're going to have better behavior. Do you think this route of communicating with pets, it requires a lot more patience than turning towards dominance theory, you know, because to be strict, to be in the moment, Mm -hmm. uh, do you find it trouble? Uh, Do you find it a little bit more difficult to balance and maybe take a step back and bite your tongue and and this type Mm -hmm. of stuff? Yes, in the sense that it requires more of me as the teacher. Mm -hmm whether it's me, the teacher, the mom, or me, the teacher, the dog's owner. And it does require me to take a step back and to essentially be the adult in the room. And to really say, okay, wait a second, am I just going to be frustrated, let things out and say, cut it out, stop, or do something like that? Or am I really going to follow up with my role and teach? what it is that I need them to do or what, or what's the appropriate thing for them to do in this situation. And that's the hardest part. That is the hardest part because it is emotional. Absolutely. I mean, I I get frustrated. Yeah, (laughs) I do. And you know, because we all get frustrated with each other. It's normal. It's natural. But I do have to make sure that I do take a step back. When I start feeling that frustration, I start to realize, okay, wait a second. So this isn't going the way I want it to. What can I do about it without resorting to being mean? And I think that's very important to hear because maybe there's some people who do want to shift from the more aggressive approach, Mm -hmm. but they don't understand this gray area that that it's okay to acknowledge the feelings of frustration. I I want to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, which I think is incredibly important. I think people who are skeptical about this positive reinforcement, it's that fear of coddling and letting them get away with everything. And how would you go about balancing that? How do you make sure that you don't? Here's a, here's a little secret. You can be as sweet to your pets as you want but guide them. That's the trick. So when they're not doing something that is appropriate, so say for example, this this guy here came to me with a little bit of uh, on-leash reactivity. He sees another dog when he's on leash and boy, he was a handful. And you can see he's no, he's not a small dog. You know, mm. this, is, this is a lot of power. Yeah. Uh, so rather than yelling at him to get him to stop growling, stop barking, you know, uh, tug on the leash to make him stop, would that have stopped him in the moment? Maybe, probably, but that's a Band-Aid, okay? Because what's going on at that point is that by my, my startling him into stopping, it's kind of scary. I just startled him. That's, you know, being startled is not a fun feeling. So how do I know? Because we don't know how to do a Vulcan mind meld. Not yet, at least. If anybody out there knows it, please tell me. <laughs> But until we do that, they're not actually associating that unpleasant feeling of, "Uh uh-oh, mom just got crazy on me. And it only happens when there's another dog out there. You know what? Now I really hate other dogs. I don't want other dogs around me because mom gets nuts. That's that behavioral fallout that I was just talking about. So what do I do instead? I do quite the opposite. If he sees another dog, he's getting chicken in his mouth. So now I'm associating great things with the presence of other dogs when he's on leash. And has it helped? Absolutely. Did it take more time than, than just yanking him on the chain? Yeah. Yes, it did. But it's also more solid. I don't have to give him as many rewards that way anymore. Because through repetition, now he sees another dog and he's already feeling good. Initially, it's because of the anticipation of food. But now it's just an automatic response on his end. It will last. That resolution will last because we're working at the emotional level. And changing that emotional state into a good emotional state, rather than one that says, "Uh uh-oh, fight or flight, or "Should should I fight, should I go away? If we get him out of that and we get him to feel good about other dogs, problem solved, he's not gonna be reacting. Now, I imagine that every pet, every dog is is going to be different. So you can't give just a one size fits all timeline. But right. for, for your dog, how long did it take to ingrain that habit and that resolution? It took about a good month or so. Okay. You know, which isn't too, too bad. And is no. it ongoing? Absolutely. Think about this. Behavior is always changing. Do you behave in the same way that you did last week? 
Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or if you're a Okay. Behavior is, it's constantly changing. That's just part of nature. Um, do I want to keep reinforcing him? Absolutely. Because I do, I want that to be as solid as possible. Okay. And you focus on the important ones. So things like coming when I call him, okay, are a very, very big one. So I'm going to keep reinforcing that. And by reinforcing, I don't mean bribing. That's another thing that a lot of people think. Okay. You're a cookie pusher. Right. You're just bribing them. That's the only reason he's doing it. The only reason he's paying attention to you is because you're stuffing chicken down his throat. Rewarding, especially with food, it's not a bribe. It's a salary. Okay? Why should he do it anything? Why would you do anything? Okay? You have to get something out of it. You do these podcasts because they, they're intrinsically rewarding to you. You feel good when you're doing them, right? Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, would you keep doing them? You're, you're the first person to call me out on that. And that's great because there's moments before where, you know, with the amount of time to negotiate, to reach out to people, to edit and then publish it. And I, I will be honest, the views aren't quite where I would like them to be. The downloads aren't quite as high as I, I would like them to be. But even when I take time off and I step aside, I, I do miss it. You, you hit the nail on the head right there. And it's the same for us. And it's the same for why we show up to work, for example. When you're going to work and you're good at your job, if your client or your boss were to say, you know, John, you're so good at this. I don't need to pay you anymore. You know, you, you know what you're doing, you learned it. Great job, you're doing a great job. So how much longer would you keep showing up for work if that were the case? It's the same thing for everyone. And the other thing too is that, yes, I could have gone to, you know, using a prong or a choke chain or even a, um, an electronic collar, shock collar, and uh, use that to get him to stop reacting that way. Uh, but in addition to that behavioral fallout that I'm talking about, chances are is that every time I see another dog when I'm walking him, I would have to pull on that chain. I would have to just do something unpleasant to him to remind him, hey, you don't do that around me, okay? Mm -hmm. But again, every time you do that, you're killing that trust. You're killing the way that he feels about other dogs as well. So you're just making things worse without even realizing it, okay? So it's like the, the, the quick fix versus the real fix that's really going to make true behavioral change. Before think being aggressive, it is the quick fix, but you're still on edge each time. Whereas when you nurture and you build this up, you still have to be aware. You still have to be mindful. You still have to be present in the moment. But yes. it, it sounds like you're building up towards something that's much more relaxing rather than every single time. Come on, you know, sit, you know, between good cop and bad cop. Like, I think bad cop is very short term, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, why did, is this really the reason you got a dog to begin with? Maybe that's something that people don't consider enough when they do want to add in uh, a member to their family. It's for superficial reasons or very short-sighted. So when you pursue something with a short-sighted vision, it's no surprise that you would use short-sighted tactics to maintain it. And, you know, when you get a dog, you're going to be this, – this furry creature is going to be with you for the next 15 years. Now, Lorena, when people seek out your services – and you're training or you're assisting them, what does that look like? Do they, they drop off their pet and they expect you to take care of everything? Or do you make sure that the owner's there to observe and watch and model? Yes, I actually go to people's homes. Okay. And I make sure that they are there. And the reason is that even though, yes, I can train their dog, could I totally train their dog? Yes. But that dog isn't going to live with me that dog isn't going to be my dog. It's important that they learn, the owner learns, how to communicate appropriately with their dog. So even more so than just teaching a dog to respond to cues, a big part of my job is getting the human end of the leash to understand their dog, to understand how they think, how they process information, and how they can better teach them. Because, you know, let's say a six-week program, we're doing great, but then... <laughs> and you know a six-week program will get them going but what about the rest of the life you know I want these owners to understand their dogs and that is a very very big big part of what I do 
So that's why I make sure that they're there. I make sure that I, I model for them what it is that I'm going to do. I get the behavior started. And um, then I give the reins off to them. I make sure that they're the ones that are practicing it and get comfortable with it because it's going to be up to them to practice all these things until we meet up the next time. What are some of the most difficult things that you see for your clients to incorporate? Uh, you know, maybe they want to be a good student. They do try to listen and follow, but they call you up and they have this most common complaint. Uh, for example, you know, with fitness training, you can write a plan, you can be there for them, you can train with them, but it's, as you mentioned, how they proceed when you're not there, that's really important. And a lot of people will say the dieting is the hardest part. Mm -hmm. not, not eating these certain things. I, I'm curious, what would be the equivalent for you in your field? You know, follow through is definitely a big part of it. And of course, you know, I, I do understand that everybody's life is pretty hectic. And you know, it's it, it requires a little bit of time. Um, but not as much time as they think they need. But even so, many times the biggest the biggest challenge that I find is when we meet up the next time and they say, "Oh, we couldn't really work on this," and you know he was still you know trying to gnaw on my hand, and you know he didn't uh, you know I I I can't get him to stop that kind of a thing, and when I ask them, "Well, did you replace? You know, did 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 you?" grab a toy to redirect him to did you do what we what we talked about is he getting enough exercise um is he eating out of food puzzles rather than just his his bowl and that's when i normally get that sheepish look that i'm sure that you're familiar with well, no oh, yeah. i didn't right and, it, it always gets me when it's like i don't say it like this but the question is more or less did you do anything and it's like no. <laughs> and again you know it's very similar to being trained. If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. You mm -hmm. know, that would be wonderful if you would be able to work out for your clients. I mean, how much more oh. would you be able to charge? <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> totally. I think most people don't realize that even when you're really diligent, our focus and concentration is very limited. Uh, I, yeah. Not even fitness. I, I think about language learning or any kind of skills acquisition. Mm -hmm. I remember in college when people would live in the library basically and stay there for eight hours at a time. I always thought that was such a waste. Very, yeah. very unnecessary. Yeah. It's a good way to burn yourself out. I do remember those days well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, humans and animals learn best in short spurts. They really, really do. So my sessions may last an hour, and we're working an hour, but I make sure that I tell my clients, listen, this is a marathon that we're doing, because not only is your dog kind of learning these things, I'm also teaching the human side of things. So uh, it's, it's the instruction for the humans that takes a little bit longer, but this is not what I tell my clients to do when they're practicing. Right. Really, the, the best... Um, the best length of time that you want to spend on any one training session with your dog is no more than three minutes at a time. Mm, really, that's okay. it. Then give them a break, give them something to chew on, put, um, you know, grab a Kong and put some food in it. Let them, you know, let them play around with that. So it is the concept of work hard, play hard, but yes, it doesn't have to be a three hour ordeal. It's something that you can easily do, even watching TV when the commercials come on. If you're watching live TV, <laughs> when the commercials come on, you can do a little training session with a handful of rewards. And if you're at home where there's very, very little distraction, you can use your kibble. Use part of what their daily intake of food is and use that. Every single one of those little nuggets can be, re can be rewards. So you can fit it in. It's, it's very easy to fit, to fit it in. You just have to kind of remember to do it. And again, yes, I'm asking people to change their routine. Otherwise, they would have never called me, right? Right. So at first, it's a little bit hard, and you kind of forget, and you have to remember to do it. But the more you do it, the more it just becomes part of your own routine. And before you know it, you're, you're helping your dog understand what it is that you want from them. Uh, Lorraine, just keeping track of time, uh, yeah. I would like to move over to some listener questions at this point. Awesome. Uh, this has been uh, the biggest response to any of my podcasts as far as questions go in a while. I think there's about eight. Yeah, sure. 
you know, we saw your dog earlier. Well, what's your dog's name, by the way? His name is Kenobi. Kenobi, that is great. Kenobi is a golden retriever? Yes, he is. Okay, is a golden retriever your favorite breed of dog? This question was, what's your favorite breed of dog? Oh, gosh. You know, personally, I did fall in love with a golden retriever a long, long time ago. So it's more of an emotional type of an attachment that I have with them. I think they are a wonderful breed. They do have their own challenges in the sense that they are a sporting breed. So, mm. yes, he does require a lot of, uh, you know, he, he requires exercise. He's an active dog. He's really, you saw the couch potato type thing here, and that's in spurts. And then there's other times when if he's not getting enough mental stimulation or if he's not getting enough physical stimulation, he is driving me up the wall. <laughs> so again, it's very, very important to consider these things when you're thinking about getting a dog. So Goldens, I think, are absolutely wonderful. Yes, genetically, they have a tendency to, ha to be very, very friendly and mellow. Now, that doesn't mean that that's what you will automatically get. You have to make sure that if you are going to get a golden retriever from a breeder, for example, you want to make sure that the breeder is a real breeder and not just a backyard hobby breeder type person. Mm -hmm. Because you want to make sure that you can meet at least the mom, at the very, very least. And this goes for any dog. Um, because it will give you an idea of the personality, the likely personality that, that your dog will wind up having when they're older. So uh, if you get there and they're saying, no, no, we can't show you the parents or the parents are just barking wildly at you behind the fence and they're, you know, they look like they're going to rip your head off, turn around <laughs> because there's a good genetic component in there that could very, very well affect the pup that you go home with. When people choose dogs, I would say that you want to really think about what they were initially bred to do and see if that kind of energy, that kind of focus that these dogs have is something that fits into your lifestyle. So more, more so than they're beautiful, than they're gorgeous, or they're small. Uh, think about which, well, which are the three criteria that most people go through, yeah. I think. Yes. Goldens, of course, they always have a soft spot in my heart. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, every dog has their charm. And there hasn't been a single dog yet in over 10 years of training that has not taught me something. They're the best teachers, they're amazing. How does communication change as your pet ages? Do you feel that it's more of revisiting some of those early lessons or do you have to adapt your style? Again, it all depends. Say for example, you've had a dog since puppyhood and then of course, as they grow, they're going to change just like we do as we grow and as we mature and even into adulthood, they're still going to change. So. With a puppy, if you've had a good basis where you know you, you have trained and you have invested that time and effort into them, the communication just because becomes so much more organic as you keep going. And it is very, very, very rewarding on both ends, quite honestly. I mean, there's some beautiful, beautiful relationships that I've seen out there between people and the dogs that they've had for a while. Now there are different changes that dogs go through from puppyhood to adolescence. Yes, they do go through a teenage period. And that is the single most uh, challenging period for any dog owner out there. That's when like, you're... Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And usually, depending on the dog, uh, it normally starts between five months of age, five or six months of age, and it can go anywhere between 18 months to about a couple of years. And that's them reaching their sexual maturity and there's hormonal changes there's all sorts of things that that take place and there's a lot of changes going in the brain as well so many dogs you'll know if you have an adolescent dog because you think you your dog lost lost its mind <laughs> they're just wondering who the heck is this what happened to my puppy that's a that's a clear sign that your dog has gone into adolescence. And what's going on in the brain at that point is that there's a lot of trimming in the, in the neurons, similar to what happens with us, with humans, as, as, as we age, you know, from, from being toddlers to going through, through puberty and, and through our teens and adolescence. There's a lot of ad adaptation that's going on. And because of that taking place, you know, you're not firing on all thrusters. And the same thing happens to dogs. So when you're going through adolescence and it's such a difficult, difficult stage, it's really important to remember, okay, really they can't help it for one because it's physi physiologically they're going through a lot of changes in the brain 
And the best thing to do is to be as consistent in your communication as possible. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know what? Uh, you know, you, you have to sit before I put my before I put your food down or your water bowl down, or you have to sit and look at me before we go outside. You know, I need you to focus on me and to calm down. And there's all sorts of different behavioral pro- protocols, that, easy protocols that you can practice with your dog to help them maintain that sense, you know, th- th- that practice of staying calm. So then there's that. Then they go into adulthood and social maturity as well, which happens to, you know, about between two and three years of age. And, um, you know, a lot of changes happen there too, especially how they relate with other dogs. And you'll notice that if you go to many doggy daycares, it's not very common to see very many dogs that are over the age of three there. Mm -hmm. And you can liken it to, you know, a dog park or a doggy daycare as going to the club, you know, when you're, I remember being in, in my 20s and, you know, going to clubs, and I thought that was awesome. But then now I'm beyond that. Right now going to the club would be, no, okay, no. <laughs> I'd rather stay home with my buds, with my friends. I, I'd rather pop open a bottle of wine and watch a good movie. Sure. And that's similar to what happens to dogs, you know, at around around the age of three. Not to say that it happens to all dogs. There's some dogs that are puppies throughout their lives. Right. And there's other dogs that just – are more introverted from the start. Mm -hmm. So you have that change. And then towards the end, yes, as they become senior dogs, and he's pouting because he's not getting attention. (laughs) I don't know if you heard the little (laughs) meal over there, big baby. (laughs) When dogs get older, then yes, there's going to be changes in the brain as well. They're not gonna be as fast, they're not gonna learn as quickly, but it's still important to maintain that mental stimulation. They may not run an an agility course, but you can definitely hide food around the house for them to use their sniffer to find. That that alone is so, so very stimulating for many dogs. Uh, Training um, new behaviors that don't require, you know, them to jump through a hoop or something like that. Uh, But something simple like, you know, uh, teaching them to paw an object or to touch an object with their nose, something very simple that doesn't require much physical movement. Um, But it's something that they're learning and that's very, very, very beneficial for dogs. It's also been said, and I just attended the North American Veterinary Community Conference. They had a huge two-day behavior symposium and behavior specialty tracks that they were talking about. And they did mention that uh, in cognitive dysfunction in older dogs, a great way to help these dogs out, even before it starts to really get, you know, um, become an issue, um, is to keep them mentally stimulated. It's very, very important. This is a really interesting one here. A lot of people fall into the habit of using baby talk when they (laughs) communicate with their pets. Do you have any say uh feelings is this a positive or negative thing or does it even do anything to to how you communicate with your pets is it better if we just use our normal speaking voices well you can use your normal speaking voice and you can definitely use the baby voice and they do react to different tones of voices so when we do go with the higher pitch of oh is that good baby it does get them you know excited it does get them happier um if you do have a dog though that is a little bit over the top you don't want to use those tones of voice because again it's just going to keep on feeding (laughs) so yes you want to use more calm more quiet lower pitch more calm more more npr (laughs) you know (laughs) that definitely can affect them just like yelling at them can definitely affect them as well and uh it's scary I'm sure we all have memories of our parents yelling at us and that horrible feeling that came with it. They go through the same thing. They release the same cortisol. They release the same adrenaline. So that's why it is important to, rather than yell, if you have to, get their attention, get them to focus instead. You know, you can't tell somebody to stop being afraid. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Right. Doesn't do it. <laughs> Now, when uh, you talk about the the pets being able to remember, just like we remember those instances, how good is a dog's memory? Well, their olfactory memory is crazy, crazy, amazingly good. They process most of their information through their sense of smell, believe it or not. You know, sometimes I've seen dogs that will be reactive around people who who smoke, for example, and it's very possible that 
an incident may have happened where somebody was smoking and that right there takes them right back to it. So the emotional memory is definitely there. It's hard to say if they remember the exact particular instance. Sure. You know, they do remember certain things that they can associate with an event, an emotional event. They can remember somebody raising their voice if they've had a bad experience with someone raising their voice. Um, doesn't mean that every dog that crouches down at somebody raising their voice has been abused at any point in time because human yelling is a scary thing anyway. <laughs> you know, quite honestly, it is. Uh, but yes, they do remember things and they do form associations uh, around the event that was emotionally stamped in their brains, if you will. So yes, and they can recall that and they can definitely react to things like that. What type of pet is the hardest to understand or communicate with? I imagine that uh, dogs are very emotive, cats <laughs> to a lesser extent. Well, they have um, ways of communicating, believe it or not. There, there, is, um, there is feline body language that's very, very telling. Um, there's certain things that both dogs and cats will do, and that's what uh, we call a tongue flick or a lip lick. And if you see a dog um, or a cat, actually, with their little tongue just comes out right over their mouth, it's really, really quick. It's a little flick. That is usually, depending on the context, of course, that is usually a sign of low-level stress of going, oh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly, you'll see that when dogs are sometimes picked up or they're physically moved from one place to another or they're in... Um, surrounded by too much commotion that they're not necessarily comfortable with. And same thing with cats. When they're um, startled by something, you'll see them kind of run away and then you'll see that little tongue flick go. Uh, cats also, a wagging tail in a cat is not a good thing. Run. Mm. <laughs> you just, just, just give the cat space. That is completely, completely not what you want to see in the cat. Is there an animal that is more difficult to communicate with than others? You know, I don't think so. I think the difficulty lies in how familiar you are with that particular species body language. Mm. So, and, you know, you don't have to be an expert to do it because quite honestly, when you want to help an animal learn, you know, or you want them to do something more often, something that you like, I'll, I'll give you the secret. All you have to do is reward the behavior that you like. Behavior that's rewarded is going to be repeated. And that really is what it boils down to. Just reward the behavior that you like. And if you see, uh, and if you catch them in the act of being good, reward them. Um, if you have a crazy dog, you know, the kind that's just bouncing off the walls, and finally at some point they actually fall asleep, believe it or not, you can very, very much whisper. And by whispering, I mean almost, almost inaudibly, you can say, you know, um, they'll hear it. Um, if you see a cat that's, you know, decided to walk by the couch and not scratch it, toss a little piece of kibble to them. Just to reward, catch the behavior that you want. Catch them in the act of being good. That goes for any, any type of animal, quite honestly. This kind of an approach works for pet dogs, this kind of, and pet cats. Um, the approach of rewarding to, you know, get behaviors is used throughout the zoos in progressive zoos here, here and in Europe as well. Um, I've seen elephants that will go up to the uh, enclosure, you know, not, not in front of everybody, but where the veterinarian needs to take, for example, a blood sample. And they've been able to train these animals without using any compulsive methods whatsoever. Wow. Go up there and stick their ear where, where it's most easiest for them to get a, a, a nice blood sample and they'll do it voluntarily. They don't have to, you know, shoot these animals with darts like we used to watch when we were kids. You know, that's you don't have to do that. You can teach them to do that. The same thing happens in um, in marine aquariums when they're, you know, when they need to take uh, blood from from the fluke of a dolphin or, or an orca or whatever. They'll do it voluntarily and they haven't done anything to punish these animals to do these things.
Because quite honestly, I mean, if they don't want to do something, they swim away. Good luck getting the animal to come back. You know? Absolutely. What's nice about that little that little equation I just gave you, just reward the behavior that you like, it is across the board for all species. What are some of the signals from pets that most people don't notice, they don't pick up? People should be more aware of these type of signs. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you're asking this. One of my biggest passions is teaching safety around dogs, uh, particularly not just with, pe with, with adults, in particular with children as well. Dogs have a very, very subtle way of indicating when they are not comfortable. And always remember that any animal that is made <clears throat> uncomfortable enough can react in a way to make you stop doing whatever it is that you're doing. And that's when bad things can happen. One of the things that most people will completely miss out on is this. That's what they do. If you approach a dog or... I've seen that look from women. I know. <laughs> and you know what? It's the exact same thing. We do it and dogs will do it. They'll just totally, just completely just look away from whatever it is that's making them feel uncomfortable. That is the simplest way of you recognizing that, oh, okay, give them space, I got it. Sometimes they'll look away and the tongue will come out, okay? And that's just them saying, yeah, I'd rather you not be here and yeah, I'm beginning to feel a little weirded out by this. And uh, there's other things that they will do to escalate that. So they'll do that or they'll try to get up and move away. Um, those are the more subtle signs that we as humans have a tendency to have absolutely no clue about. So of course we don't even recognize it. But then there's also signs that are a little bit more overt. And uh, think of it this way. They have to escalate if we're not getting the message. Just like normally I, I, I use the, the, the human side of things of a girl who might be waiting for her buddies at a bar and some weird guy comes up to her and he said he sits right next to her she might just kind of move over a little bit that's a little sign saying no i'd rather not go away but if the guy isn't getting getting the message he might still push the subject she might turn around she might get up and move to another seat if he follows her and if he keeps annoying her she's going to have to escalate and say hey dude back away if he doesn't get that she might throw her, her drink in his face. And if that doesn't work, she might ask the bouncer to do something about it. Yeah. So it's the same way for our animals. And very, many times we miss out on those signals until we finally get to a very, to, this, to what we consider a scary spot, which it might be a growling or the showing of the teeth. And the important thing to also consider about those things is that they're not being bad. It's not an insult, it's communication. So please, please, please respect the growl. It's your dog saying, I'm not okay with this, please stop, all right? And I have to do it this way because I was telling you before, but you didn't pick up on it. So never, ever, ever, ever punish a growl. It's essentially you're taking the timer away from the bomb if you do, mm -hmm. okay, if you punish a growl. It's communication, it's not a personal insult, it's not a personal front to you. Uh, yes, I mean, when, when our own dogs do that and, you know, we missed out on something and your own dog growls at you, you're like, oh, how dare you? I love you. How could you do that to me? But remember that being the human that you are, the, one with the bigger brain, remember that that is the only way that they can communicate. And they've, they've been communicating, but we've missed it. So he's just letting you know, no, really, I don't want this. Listen to your dog, listen to things like that. For the most part, dogs will avoid rather than go and go for, for the attack, unless they've learned that the avoidance thing doesn't work for them. Then they'll escalate a lot faster. But yes, those things, that little head turn, that'll give it, give it away. The other one that's also very, very easy to spot is when a dog goes from and they close their mouth. That's, that's an uptick in the arousal level. And by that, I mean emotional arousal level. That mm -hmm. just tells you, okay, something happened. And it could be as simple as, oh, I heard something outside and I'm trying to get more information. Or it could be, oh, I was happily laying down here and now you came over and sat next to me to the couch, next to the couch, and I really didn't, you know, didn't want either you or this bouncing child to come and sit next to me because he kind of scares me because he moves around crazy and he screams and he's unpredictable, you know? And that's what happens a lot with kids. A lot of these cues, they're concentrated in body language. Is there any other, I mean, that makes sense. Is there any other ways to pick up cues? 
again, body language is going to be the most, the single most clear way that dogs will communicate. They're nonverbal, so mm-hmm. they don't do all that yakking that we do. And uh, it's, it's very nuanced. I mean, they really, really, really do talk quite a bit with their language. And uh, really what you want to see is a dog that looks relaxed rather than a dog that looks tense. And always look at their shoulders. You'll see that tenseness build up in their shoulders. So the moment that you start seeing a little bit of tenseness, the best thing to do is just give them space. And they'll come to you when they're ready. And it's okay. This listener, they have a dog that they're uh, taking care of. And they're not afraid of the dog. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is a person who probably prescribes to the dominance theory of pet management so far. But um, when walking the dog, dog doesn't always follow them. She tries to stay calm. How would you handle this situation? When they go outside, it for them, it, that's Disney World. I mean, that is exciting. So the first thing to realize is that, yes, they're going to be excited when they're out there because they're going to be sniffing all sorts of things. It's amazing the amount of information that's just everywhere. (laughs) We're basically blind when it comes to that, quite honestly, as humans. We just don't have the equipment built into our human bodies to, you know, pick up all that information. So that's one of the main things to realize is that, you know, when you're walking your dog and your dog's just going everywhere, it's not that they're just trying to, you know, that they're trying to get away from you or that they're trying to establish dominance over you or anything like that. No, they're just excited to be out in the world. So how to get them to focus back on you is very simple. You have to make yourself more interesting than the world around you. And what's a really great way, simple way of doing that? Well, go back to your currency, the currency that you don't have to teach them about which is food, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that you have to feed them constantly, but you can take their breakfast with you when, when you're walking. And anytime, the, you know, start out with anything they're able to give you to begin with. So if your dog's going all over the place and he happens to turn around, even by mistake, in your direction, you get down there and shove that treat in, in their nose, in front of their nose. If they, get, if they eat it, that's a good sign. That means that they're not over their threshold. If they're not getting it, if they can't eat it, that means that they're so, so, so excited that they're just, you know, the blinders are on. They're just, I'm not paying attention to anything. I'm just going every which way. It could be that that particular environment is just way too distracting for them. You know, if you're walking them down the sidewalk, for example, and there's cars going by or too many people, that may not be the best environment for him yet. Okay, you can work up to it, but you may want to think about taking him for walks in less distracting environments so that you can teach your dog to pay attention to you, to remember that, hey, there's a human holding onto that leash. <laughs> you know, I got somebody with me. So that's, that's um, something that you want to consider. And at home, very, very simple, a very simple thing that anybody can do, and I recommend for ed- everyone to do it, is just to grab a handful of treats or a handful of kibble, put it in your hand, close it, wave it in front of their noses so that they know you've got something and then bring it up to your, bring it up to your face. And all you're doing at that point is just kind of getting your dog to pay attention to around the face. Okay. And as soon as they do, you say, good boy. And you give them that and repeat over and over again. Good job. Okay. And what you're doing is that you're teaching them to look up towards you to realize, Hey, they've got something good over there they're worth paying attention to. So again, like anything else, unless he practices that, he's not gonna be very good at it. So that's something that you can do with very few distractions. And then when you take it out into the world, you're gonna have to pay him a bonus. So the kibble may not necessarily hack it, nor the milk bones. So you may have to cut up some hot dogs or string cheese and cut it down into tiny little pieces. About half the size of your pinky nail is as, as big as it needs to be. Practice those kind of things that you're just kind of saying, hey, look at me. Oh, good job. Here you go. Here's your treat. Let's keep sniffing. And now about sniffing, this is very, very important. When you walk your dog, it's crucial that you do sniffy walks. A sniffy walk is the walk where you let them sniff to their heart's content. Again, that goes back to that mental stimulation, which is even, quite honestly, just as important as as physical exertion. But when it comes to walks, it's important to let them sniff and get that information and figure out that there was a squirrel that went through here and, oh, Brutus came by and he marked over here. Let me mark over there too. And, you know, 
all that that's so enriching for them and so healthy for their brain that it is very very important and don't worry you're not going to be sitting there at a spot for a half hour what you want to do is that you're walking and they find something interesting start a countdown in your head from 15 seconds chances are before you get to zero your dog's like okay i'm done with that let's keep going and if not then you can do a hey come on let's go and then you can keep moving but let them stop let them sniff it's not about the go 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 I didn't call you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, to to uh, affirm your idea, I think uh, again, just being able to relate to fitness, it's mm -hmm. it's not getting too caught up in the end goal. So in this case, it's not getting too caught up in the idea that we're supposed to be taking the walk, but enjoying the walk, enjoying the journey exactly. along the way. Exactly, and build that bond that way because you know you do you do build an an increased bond by just hanging out and enjoying enjoying the smells and, and going out there and and even asking well what, what are you sniffing what'd you get I, I can't tell you know and just talk to them it's okay it's all right they enjoy the sound of your voice what, what? that right there is not a growl that is called the golden grunt mm. and they do they do the little grunty thing and again you can tell his um his eyes are soft their gaze is soft he's relaxed his ears are relaxed, you know, so you're looking at the whole relaxation thing. So yeah, it's a very, very different sound. But um, so yes, going back to the walks, do your sniffy walks, let them explore, it's good for them. It's actually essential for their psychological and behavioral well-being. It's really, really super important. Now, can you take them on a run? Sure, but what you wanna do is set up certain certain patterns so that they start to realize that oh when my owner puts on those shoes it means we're going for the run or when they you know put the leggings on or the running shorts on oh we're going for a run okay this is a run run walk but when it's you're just dressed like regular and if you if you only take your dog for a run start taking them on regular walks then that's when you're just kind of just going and just kind of just meandering and they're just sniffing to their heart's content let them do that that's really really important so for the for the caller I would say you know if your dog is out there and he's just going from one place to another and go go one place and just sniffing and not paying any attention to you start out by letting them sniff let them lead you as long as it's safe obviously let them lead you to where they want as you keep going within a minute or so you may start noticing that your dog is not as crazy anymore because again they got that out of their system and that's important Everything that you said so far in this episode, I've I've been more quiet than usual just because I'm, I'm taking it all in. I find it very interesting because I think 20, 30 years ago, if you hear someone say they treat their children like dogs, hugely <laughs> negative connotation towards that. But right. now, um, you know, I, I hope when people listen to this, they're aware that, you know, if you want to analyze the crossover, like you said, it's not about bribing, but being aware reinforcing those positive traits uh just the way you're, you're communicating and being attentive overall i think that's what people need to learn to be better communicators in general and that's my my other huge interest aside from fitness just communication mm -hmm. and wow you know just so much to tie into there so thank you for all of that um lorena was there any other point that you wanted to touch on before we get into the contact information? Absolutely. The biggest thing that I want to tell anybody out there, first of all, if you have any questions or you have any concerns about your dog, don't wait until it gets horribly bad before reaching out for help. And when you want to reach out for help, make sure that you do seek out someone who does work exclusively with positive reinforcement. Don't um, try to stay away from those who would use intimidation who would use the you know the dominance theory that that dominance model because it has been shown to be harmful and i can't tell you how many clients i personally have gotten because they they were trained by a trainer who who used those techniques so i've seen it and it's very real and the damage is very real and there's some really great resources out there when you're when you're looking for someone to help you out a very very big one is called the pet professional guild and that is petprofessionalguild.com you can look for people uh trainers throughout throughout the country there and you can be sure that those are people who are using positive reinforcement 
and who are using uh, methods that are gentle and uh, focus on on really the, the the true behavioral wellness of the dog. Another one that I would definitely, definitely recommend is Positively.com, and that is Victoria Stilwell's um, website, and you may know her from It's Me or the Dog. And she's got an incredible, incredible amount of information on her website. In addition to that, she also has a very, very incredible network of trainers. Uh, they're Victoria Stilwell Positively Dog Trainers, and you can look for for them um, in your area as well. And that's almost like having her coming to you. Um, obviously, she can't be everywhere at once, but yes, uh, the trainers there are very much vetted by her. She doesn't lend her name to just anyone, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, li little disclosure here. Yes, I am one of them, but I'll tell you that it was a very, very, very um, detailed and very intense vetting process. And I'm glad that she's doing that quite honestly, because again, this not being a regulated industry, it's very easy to get to someone and hire someone who can actually do more harm than good. And really not, not necessarily out of meanness, it's just that they don't have the education that's really needed for this. For those who wanna get in touch with you, if they wanna contact you, Lorena, how can they do that? Well, my website is waggersdogworks.com. That's W-A-G-G-E-R-S-D-O-G-W-O-R-K-S.com. And that is the best way to reach me. There's uh, My contact information will be there. Uh, it'll tell you a little bit more about me, things that I think, uh, the way that I approach things, why I'm doing this. Um, so, yes, please, please come visit. And also on, um, on Facebook, you can also like my page, and that is uh, facebook.com slash Waggers Dog Works. And also on Twitter, um, my handle on Twitter is at Waggers Dogs. Lorena, again, thank you so much for your time. Very, very insightful stuff here. Thank you so very much. It has been honestly my honor. I don't take it lightly. Thank you for listening. Thank you for allowing me to share what I know. And just keep being good to your dogs. Keep, keep focusing on the positive. Keep rewarding the good that you see in them because there is plenty.